Okay, not hearing anything, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Eric Bothy. He's a project manager with the Board of Public Service for the city of St. Louis, and he will get us started. Hello, everyone, how are you doing? Um, I'm Eric Bothy, as uh, John, oh, I'm sorry, Travis said. Um, here to talk about the ADA self-evaluation and transition plan. Uh, <clears throat> Just a few housekeeping uh, items. Oh, well, Travis has already talked about this. So I think that we are good to go on this, uh, except for that um, maybe he didn't mention that it will be available for download after this presentation. Um, next slide. We are going to, uh, the outline of the presentation is that uh, we're going to do a team overview here shortly. Um, and then David Newberger is going to go over why we need a transition plan <clears throat> and talk about our ongoing city efforts. And then after that, um, and then our current city efforts, and then we'll talk about community engagement and it over to OITS after that. Talk about that. Um, next slide. She's got it. Team overview, uh, me up on the left there, um, Eric Bothy, and then David Newberger, our ADA coordinator um, with the Office on the Disabled, and Andrew Lackey, Deputy Commissioner of the um, Office on the Disabled. <clears throat> um, next we have Oates, and um, this is Travis, uh, Travis Helmkamp who is the project manager, Mike Bush, who is the project principal, and uh, Jim Din Young with uh, ADA consultant, national ADA consultant. And also there's Gina Hilberry, who is with Coleman Hilberry Architects, and uh, Sean Martin with M3 Engineering. And I'm going to hand it off to David Newberger. I have to turn off my mute, I apologize, but here I am. Um, they, as many of you know, when the ADA was passed in 1990, uh, it required uh, all state and local governments, of which the city is within that definition, uh, who had more than 550 employees to prepare a self-evaluation and transition plan. Self-evaluation in shorthand is to uh, list all of the barriers to access within the city, both physical and programmatic. And uh, the transition plan is to create a schedule and a plan for eliminating those barriers from year to year. Uh, the, the city has never really thoroughly done that. And I used to be embarrassed by it, but the fact is that most cities in the country haven't really, certainly the large ones have not really gotten that done. I, I once asked the ADA coordinator in New York City whether they had a transition plan. And he said, we only have it for parks because I was head of parks for a while. Uh, and th that's not unusual. Uh, cities are in various situations uh, of solving it. Uh, but it, it is clearly a roadmap for how we can make our city accessible. And so uh, we have been able to uh, obtain, obtain some capital financing uh, for this project. And, and that's really what we're talking about today. It's that, that contract. It, in, it includes both Oates Associates, which are uh, engineers and are looking at physical plant along with Gina Hilberry, who's going to look at buildings. Uh, and there's a review of standards and review of uh, uh, po policies and programs within the organization. Uh, quite frankly, uh, the amount of money that's available there sounds like a lot. It's 1.5 million. But the fact is, we can't begin to cover the whole city. And so what we look forward to is a, multitude, a multiple of years uh, each year getting better and better. But the benefit of all of that 
uh, of our doing what we're doing now is that we are attempting to uh, to standardize uh, and to organize what we do so that we can keep uh, track of what needs to be done, what has been done, and, and what needs to be done uh, in the future. And in the end, we want this to be as accessible a city as possible. And again, I want to emphasize it's not just physical accessibility, it's accessibility for everybody with every kind of disability. So if I could have the next slide. Uh, the, uh, the, the whole point is to, as I just jumped ahead probably, but the whole point uh, is to get control over uh, what we've done in the past, to, get, to figure out what standards we've been following, and then to go forward with uh, developing a plan for the future. And then the next slide. Uh, the city, we've made a point. Uh, we've had an office uh, on the disabled since 1974. Uh, and over the years, we have done many things that make our programs accessible. And I listed a few here, it's just some examples, but there's a variety of, uh, uh, of efforts that we've undertaken and continue to undertake uh, to help folks uh, who, who require uh, some kind of assistance and, and to uh, just make the world a little bit better for people with disabilities. And that has included our requiring accessibility and new construction uh, both uh, in buildings and, and in streets. But that's just some of what we've done. It hasn't been cataloged, it hasn't been prioritized. And so while it is, it, we've always done something we thought was important, we can't say that we were really that organized to know whether we were getting to the most important first. Then the next slide. Uh, and, and here, I mean, as you've probably seen, but we have, uh, a lot of curb ramps uh, in the city, so, uh, as many as uh, 2,000 miles of sidewalks in the city. And you can see, those of you who have the uh, notice these things, that there are really curb ramps over time, all over time. Uh, many of them are not according to standards uh, that we would follow now, but there was basically just people started making curb ramps. Uh, and that's good, but those need to be improved and they need to be, uh, we, we need to make sure that they come up to the code standards that are out there. Of course, I'm always arguing that if a curb ramp is reasonably passable, that's not the first one we would repair. We'd worry about those that just aren't there and those that are broken uh, to get to them first. Uh, but we've uh, done other things. Uh, our entrances and parks are accessible. Uh, we have done a lot of work with comfort stations in the parks uh, to make them accessible. We've put elevators in buildings. Uh, we've done a lot of things, uh, but there is much more for us to do. And so the next slide is to give over to Jim uh, the opportunity to talk about what comes next. Thank you, David. And before I begin, I, I'll pause for a second just to see if there sorry folks um i'll just pause for a second thank you david to see if there's any questions uh to from people at this moment not hearing or seeing any um i'll move forward uh the current city self-evaluation efforts um include all programs and activities and services of the city of St. Louis. And so when we look at this, we're not just talking about the physical plant, although that's what we look at with regards to the transition plan, but we're also looking and making sure that there is access to all program services and activities uh, within the St. that are sponsored by St. Louis government. Um, what we're trying to do is continue uh, the ongoing city efforts to increase accessibility uh, whether that be to a library, whether that be to a, a voting facility, whether that be to City Hall, uh, it's important that access be gained to all those places or improved, as David said. There might be a level of accessibility, but it may not be fully compliant with the Americans with Disabilities Act at this time. 
And so we're looking at all of those issues to try to bring them up to uh, to a level of accessibility that's acceptable to the citizens. We're trying to consolidate the past ADA efforts while developing new guidelines for the city. Currently, there's a multitude of guidelines that uh, people have had to look at, whether it be a private business or a contractor or the city. And what they're doing right now is reviewing those city standards to incorporate the federal and state guidelines that will be important to truly create accessibility while meeting the ADA guidelines uh, for all citizens and visitors uh, of St. Louis. To do that, we've done a partial self-evaluation of the city programs, activities, and services. I think as you realize and you heard uh, David speak about, it would have been nearly impossible to have looked at all the sidewalks in the city, to look at all the curb cuts, to have been able to look at all the buildings. So we tried to get a good example of and representation. We were in every ward of the city uh, to look at the physical plant with regards to the sidewalks, the buildings, the access from, for instance, uh, uh, bus stops to the sidewalks and, and to the buildings and the multiple locations in which a, an individual may arrive to attend a city function. Obviously, one could be rolling to it or walking to it. One could be taking public transportation. One could be being dropped off. And of course, one could be using their own vehicle to get there. So we need to look at the parking lots. So we've looked at the current condition of city buildings and properties and parks. We're a representation of that. Not all of them, but as what we felt was a very strong and, and the city agreed representation of those various areas. Um, but we're also looking to help identify future improvements to focus on identifying these barriers and then providing the conceptual costs to improve the pedestrian network as well. I think as you realize, this will take a great deal of budgeting uh, by the city to be able to address the various issues, as well as a schedule for completing the remaining assets. But currently, they'll be able to incorporate this data. So if they're working on a particular area, they'll already have the data as to what will need to be improved. We'll talk a little bit more later about your involvement in this. Thank you, Jim. Uh, the next thing that we really uh, are diving into on this is the review of city policies. Uh, sort of taking a look at those standard construction details and really looking at sort of what improvements can we make so that as something is constructed in the city of St. Louis, it's constructed to the applicable local, state, and federal standards. Um, really what we're trying to do is whether it's uh, something that's being constructed as part of a Board of Public Service project, whether it's being constructed by MoDOT, a private developer, or from the uh, street department, or another department within the city, we're really looking for that consistent construction project. Uh, not only does that help the city to ensure compliance moving forward, but it also um, provides sort of a level of expectation that as someone's walking through the street, there's a general sort of, this is what the curb ramps are like in the city, this is what the sidewalks are like, and um, ultimately that's done by establishing the ADA criteria to determine compliance. Uh, the city, is um, has made great strides in uh, checking plans and making sure everything's compliant before construction begins. Another element is to uh, implement a post-construction inspection so that after it's physically constructed that we're looking at compliance at that point as to what was actually constructed. I think sort of uh, what we're getting ready to talk about now next is sort of the actual physical efforts that we took out on the streets and the buildings. So with that, I would like to take a second to give anybody who would like to ask a question, a chance to ask a question before we sort of move on to a different topic. Not hearing any questions. Uh, as far as, and Jim mentioned this, we are doing a partial assessment. Uh, city of St. Louis is a large city, uh, but we are starting that process. And really, hello. Oh, hello. Go ahead. I'm I'm sorry. This is Colleen Starkloff. I'm having a little technology failure here today. Um, yes, 
First of all, I want to thank you guys for doing this because this is some of the most basics of accessibility for people with disabilities and um, pedestrians rights of way, but also the, the, the very careful construction and maintenance of curb cuts is critical. My husband was, was dumped out of his wheelchair, Max Starkloff, years ago at an intersection because of a lip on a curb cut. And um, so I can't underscore, and I've used his wheelchair at various different times when I've needed to and found um, a lot of problems with curb cuts, with them deteriorating and not being maintained well, but, but some of them not being built well in the first place. So I, I really thank you for this. It occurs to me, however, that um, one of the issues needs to be the training of the personnel who actually do the work. I live on the corner of Laclede and um, Newstead, and very, at various times, people have come out to make some repairs because the lips will deteriorate at the edge of the curb cut and the street. And I've noticed that when the guys come and they fill in with asphalt or something, they leave a lip. And I invariably bring it up. I've, I've seen them do it, and I go down there and talk to them, but they can't. They're not going to listen to me. They don't know who the heck I am and don't care. They're just come out and sent. So I think it's really important to note that training and then for to understand that a smooth transition, excuse me, the smooth transition is critically important. We've, we've had people visiting from other cities. We were coming back from a ball game one night and um, a guy was quadriplegic and was uh, pushing his manual wheelchair and he hit a lip and he literally tumbled out head first. Um, so I, I can't underscore how critically important attention to this is and that those guys who actually do the work understand seamless is it can be, it can be life-saving. Thank you. Colleen, thank you very much for that comment. And, and please understand too, that in our surveying to begin the process, part of what the next phase will be once we have come to a standard of clarity with this, with the city as well. And I'll let David address that is to train people within the various departments. So there is consistency across St. Louis and all the departments. David, did you want to add? Well, uh, what I wanted to say is that we've, we've always had this problem uh, with the streets department that, when they put in a new curb ramp, they leave that lip because they think that they're going to come back in a few years and and put more surface on the road, and they don't want the uh, to have have the new surface on the road higher than the curb ramp. But it, what we need, and this is an example of a standard that we need to establish and have the streets department follow, and that is if they're going to have that lip that they're not done until they patch the lip to, to, to the uh, street so that that correction is made in the interim and then uh, subsequently when a new road comes along or new surface comes along, uh, w w they avoid that problem. But uh, that's a very important point that Colleen is making. It's very important, uh, David and, and Colleen both. and and. Um, I think as we've all had a chance to travel, we see this issue nationally a great deal. That's one of those yeah, we, do. we continually need to hammer on. Uh, Colleen, it happened to me at my daughter's graduation in D.C. at, at George Washington <laughs> also. So um, I don't um, know too many pairs and quads that haven't come up on this, and it's so basic, but it's so dangerous for our people. Well, we'll work with David in any way we can uh, to make that a reality. Thanks, guys. Can I just jump in one more time to uh, what one of our main goals here, and you're going to hear about a, uh, a survey that we're putting out uh, to try to get public re telling us about issues. But our main goal uh, uh, right now is what we call community involvement. And the statutes require that and so forth. And a lot of times, uh, you'll pardon the expression, it's BS. But we really want the disability community to emphasize what the important stuff is and to guide the decisions that the city makes in order to make the place more accessible, uh, first in the most important places and then throughout. I believe we have a question or comment from the chat.
Yeah, there was just one comment uh, that says, I agree with the training. Wonderful and amazing results follow when we take time to show the people installing. I have found they were grateful and improved installations. The Society for the Blind will be willing to help with the training. Thank you for that comment. Excellent. Thank you very much for the question. Thank you very much for the comment. And yeah, I think it's a point well served that as we look at constructing things properly on paper, I think it's critical that what we design on paper is ultimately what's passed out to the field because that's what matters at the end. So um, if there are no more questions, and as time goes on, if, if a question comes to mind and you would like to uh, type it into the chat, uh, we will address any questions or comments that come through the chat as well. Moving on, um, now we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the physical uh, assessments that we did as part of this first phase of the ADA transition plan. Uh, they can kind of be broken up into two groups. The first group being the uh, survey of the pedestrian assets for ADA compliance. And uh, what we looked at as part of that assessment is not only the sidewalks, but also the curb ramps, as well as the pedestrian traffic signals throughout the city of St. Louis. And really what we're looking at whenever we assess these is uh, going beyond the question of sort of, is it compliant or not compliant? And uh, looking at sort of, uh, what's the actual impact that it has to people's ability to roll or walk around the city? Um, scoring wise, ultimately what we're looking to get out of this data is to uh, have an ability to compare various assets throughout the city of St. Louis in the hopes of identifying those sidewalks, curb ramps, and pedestrian signals that are in locations where we expect there to be large numbers of pedestrians and where the sidewalk curb ramp or pedestrian traffic signal is really in such a condition that it truly makes ac accessing those uh, pedestrian traffic generators, the city hall, places like that that we know people are trying to get to. Uh, the way we did that is by uh, developing a two-part scoring system. The first part of that scoring system, and we'll dive into this a little bit later on, is the uh, citywide priorities map. And really what we're looking at with the citywide priorities map, as I already kind of mentioned, is sort of an effort to estimate where pedestrians are trying to get to and where pedestrians are starting. The second part of that is an accessibility score. Uh, that accessibility score is really looking at sort of how usable is the uh, pedestrian element. Uh, to that end, we assign a value to each barrier. I think a good sort of example of this is a quarter inch lip obviously is an impact on people's ability to get around the city. But a two inch lip is a much greater impact for their ability to get around the city. So we're looking to kind of move beyond and identify those barriers to access that truly impact someone's ability to uh, get around. Uh, Jim always has a really good example of this in which uh, he describes, and he's currently having a technical issue, so I will do my very best to tell his story for him. Um, in a wheelchair, sort of, if a cross slope is at 3%, it impacts, it impacts his ability in his wheelchair. But if a cross slope is at say 10%, 12%, then at that point it truly is becoming a safety concern and it truly impacts his ability to get around the city. So with that accessibility score, that's really what we're attempting to do. We're attempting to quantify the impact of that barrier to all pedestrians and their ability to continue to move around the city. Um, sort of for the citywide priorities map, I've already hit on this a little bit, but really what we're looking at there is that it's based on sort of two main factors. The first of those factors is uh, pedestrian traffic generators. And uh, when you think of a pedestrian traffic generator, what we're really talking about is sort of what, what draws people to walk to somewhere, uh, city parks, city schools, government buildings, 
things of that nature in which uh, people are walking there for enjoyment. Uh, for government buildings, not only are we looking at local government buildings, but also state and federal government buildings, uh, post offices being a really good example of that. Another, another key pedestrian traffic generator, and in our past conversations with some disability advocates and disability groups, we kind of hear the same thing over and over again, that if you can get someone to the Metro bus, from there they can really get access to the rest of the city. So one of our key pedestrian traffic generators was those Metro bus stops and providing access along the city sidewalks to those Metro stops. Uh, lastly, uh, commercial corridors. It's where people are going to shop, uh, places of employment, sort of uh, things like that, and really sort of how that is a critical service for all residents of the city. The second part of the scoring data that we used for the citywide priorities map was socioeconomic data that we got from East West Gateway Council of Government. This is based on the 2010 census data as well as uh, more recent data since then. And a couple examples of sort of why we looked at socioeconomic data is because it gave us an idea of where zero car households are located at throughout the city. If someone doesn't have access to a vehicle, there's a higher likelihood that they're going to be using the sidewalk to get around the city. Uh, another example that we looked at for socioeconomic data was population density. If there's a large number of people living in a small area, it not only increases the likelihood of someone using the pedestrian network, but also just increases the physical amount of people who are in that area who are looking to get around. Uh, last, and I think a really critical element of this socioeconomic data, is looking at where people with disabilities live within the city of St. Louis. Uh, this allows us to look at not only those residents that are perhaps most sensitive to these barriers to access, but also in reviewing studies, uh, there is a correlation between access to an automobile and a person who's living with a disability. And ultimately, what this citywide priorities map allows us to do is to really identify areas in the city in which it's reasonable to expect that there's going to be a lot of pedestrian traffic and really sort of shift our focus when it comes to sort of kickstarting these improvements on those areas that receive heavy usage. In addition to the pedestrian assets on public rights of way, we're also looking at uh, various city buildings, properties, and parks and assessing those for ADA accessibility. Uh, we are surveying select buildings as part of phase one. That does include City Hall as well as 1520 Market. We are also currently looking at surveying some parks, some recreation centers, uh, a police substation. But uh, I think this is one area in which we are really sort of looking for community engagement and looking for sort of feedback from especially uh, this group here of sort of, is there a building that we're not thinking about that either one offers a critical service of the city or two is a consistent challenge for residents to get into and to access those services that they need. So uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more in community engagement. But I think this is one area in which we uh, really could use this, the population's help with sort of making sure that we identify those key buildings as we sort of start this assessment process. Uh, as far as the buildings themselves, really everything starts with assessing site arrival points. And that includes not only parking lots where uh, people are arriving via vehicle, but also looking at how does someone get to the city of building if they take Metro bus? Or how does someone get from the public sidewalk along the street and into the city building? Uh, by starting there and by figuring out how someone can get into the building, from there we really are looking at sort of what are the programs and services offered within that building? And also what are the barriers to access to get to those programs and services? Uh, we really think this is sort of a critical element because uh, we, it may not always be feasible to do a lot of heavy construction immediately, but there is an opportunity to perhaps relocate a program or service that is offered up on the third floor and the uh, elevator is not accessible. But if we can relocate that service down to the first floor 
and eliminate those barriers to access, then we can still provide access to that key city program or service while ultimately working towards upgrading the building. And um, I think this is something that Colleen hit on a little bit earlier, is an, another part of this is to prepare city staff to obtain future surveys. While the city staff themselves uh, may not be the ones going out and completing the surveys, it's making sure that there's an understanding of sort of, this is what the survey shows, these are the recommendations, so that these can really be used moving forward. Um, this is Jim, and I'm back on now, and I apologize to people that uh, I'm technical, technologically challenged, uh, along with a few other things. But um, I, we did want to just clarify here that the next steps will be to finalize the citywide priority map, as well as establish a budget and schedule to complete that self-evaluation, and we want to identify a potential project to kickstart to really get the city enthused and excited about the idea of us eliminating barriers and increasing the accessibility. So um, those are sort of the next steps we're going to. But before that, and more important, um, from my viewpoint, and I think uh, the people that I see listed attending this session today, the exciting part of this will be that you get to get your input please take advantage of this online survey. Um, this is exciting to me. Um, it's not always a chance we have to input to government. And this is our chance to do that, where you're able to go on to the survey site, as you can see there, uh, listed. And if anybody's having difficulty, I'll just pause for a moment to make sure it's being interpreted. And um, before I go any further, too, I notice we have a question at this time. Thanks, Jim. We have another question from the chat. Has the city begun thinking about indoor navigation tools, such as using beacons for the blind in public buildings? David, I'll leave that for you, I believe. Uh, the, the answer is that we haven't gone there yet. Uh, I think that we need to do that, and I also think that we need to think about uh, augmenting our audio uh, at meetings and presentations and so forth. Those are all, in my mind, barriers that, that are important for us to address. We thank you very much for that, that question or input, uh, because with technology, we're learning that there are multiple ways uh, to address assisting people in wayfinding. And I think uh, you bring up a great point. We appreciate it. And that, again, I'm going to stress. And, hey, you know, they say I get too excited about this stuff, but I really believe in democracy and the input of the citizens is please, please, please take advantage of the survey and fill it out. Pass it on to your friends and neighbors, uh, other family members. We want as, we want to make this as robust as possible. And really, you're our liaisons to make that happen throughout the city. Uh, the more information we get, the more accurate it'll be, uh, the more ability we'll have to be able to work with the city, I know, in trying to prioritize the areas. I don't want to mislead anybody that it, just because you fill out the survey, it means your sidewalk will be done next week. Um, but by filling that out, it will allow us to know the most critical areas as located to the greatest number of services and programs uh, provided by the city. We realize that every point is important, and it's only you can tell us what that is from your perspective. So again, I'm excited by this. I hope you are to take advantage of filling this out sharing it with as many people as you possibly could. If you have a membership list, please feel free to send this link out to those people uh, so they're able to participate. Again, to me in this exciting part of democracy as the city is working very hard to become ADA compliant and increase accessibility, not only for all of us, but for future generations, as well as the many visitors uh, that wish to come to St. Louis. And I would just say, if I may, uh, the question about uh, wayfinding and beacons, uh, that, that's an item that's going on my checklist. That, that's one of the things that we will address. 
This is Colleen. Can I ask a question? Of course. Um, oh, shoot. What's the question? Um, so I forgot it for a second, guys. I'll, I'll be back in. I, I was listening to David and Jim and forgot the question. No, I was going to say, um, as soon as you think of it, please interrupt us and we'll uh, address it to the best of our ability. Thank uh, you. This, this is Jeff Barney. I have a comment. Yes, Jeff. So I'm the superintendent for Missouri School for the Blind. And uh, just for a comment on those beacons, the American Printing House for the Blind has a great program that goes along with those beacons. And they are often willing to help out uh, set up those beacons in a very cost effective way. So they would be uh, more than willing to um, use their expertise and if you contact them. And um, I've been working on trying to get that in my school for a while, but um, they're very helpful in that. So just FYI. A great lead. And Jeff, that's the American Printing House for the Blind? Yeah, it's in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Excellent. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, we have a question from the chat. Thank you, Travis. <clears throat> the question is, will, will you be sending this link out with information so that we can share with individuals affiliated with our agencies? Absolutely. Um, I was going to say, uh, anybody who was on the original invite for this list will be receiving a follow-up email from me. And that will have uh, links to get to the surveys, uh, a short little blurb that can be added to sort of a newsletter of sort of explaining why we're going out for information, as well as if you would like a copy of the presentation today or a transcript, we can certainly get that to anybody who would request it as well. Uh, to that end, sort of, uh, I think we would strongly encourage you to contact us. If there's a way that we can help you get this information out to anybody, please reach out to us and let us know. Uh, as I think sort of we've, hopefully we've shown today is we are very serious and very passionate about getting as much feedback on this as possible. I know we talked a lot about like the citywide priorities map, but that is not a final product. That is designed to be fluid over time, to adjust as the city adjusts, and to also adjust as sort of priorities change within the city. So uh, feedback is still most definitely needed and will definitely be used in the shaping of this plan. If you would like to reach out to us, uh, this last slide has contact information for Eric Bothy. Again, he's the project manager for the Board of Public Service, as well as contact information for the Office on the Disabled, uh, David Newberger and Andrew Lackey. We have also created an email address if uh, you want to reach out to us. That email address actually goes to the Office on the Disabled, Eric, as well as myself so that we can see that and address any uh, questions or any ways that we can help you out. That email address is ADA underscore STL at stlewis-mo.gov. And whenever I send out the uh, follow-up, it will also include uh, that email as well. Uh, this is Colleen. Oh, go ahead. Uh, can I can I jump back in because I thought of it? And, and it's more to bring up an issue that I think is going to take some resolve, perhaps, between the Board of Aldermen. Um, it's my understanding, and I could be wrong, that um, if you have an eruption in your sidewalk in front of your house and you want to get it fixed, that um, there may be a way that the city helps you pay for it but a lot of times what I see in my neighborhood, because we have a lot of people in wheelchairs that wheel around in my neighborhood, um, they'll get in the street because there is somewhere along the sidewalk an obstruction where, where a piece of sidewalk has erupted and their wheelchair can't go over it, maybe because of a tree limb, you know, a tree trunk or something. And um, if you can't make the property owner fix their sidewalk, uh, wonder if the city could have any way of looking at it that it would be safer t for the city to fix it so that somebody in the neighborhood uh, is able to stay on the sidewalk and not wheel in the street. We have had people using wheelchairs um, 
been hit by cars and killed, Lisey Banson remains on my mind. And so I, it's, it's just an issue to bring up because it's something that has to be figured out. What are the mechanics of that? But, uh, there, there are neighborhoods that are have very fairly dense uh, populations of persons with disabilities using scooters or wheelchairs, and uh, it's something to be on your radar. Well, uh, let me just say, Colleen, that first of all, I've been known to roll down the streets too because the sidewalks are bad. Uh, for better, I know, David. <laughs> but uh, one of the things, and this is, you're right about mentioning the Board of Aldermen. Uh, this is a bit of a lo more long range project because it's going to require new legislation. But I am of the view that we need to fix the sidewalks block by block, uh, not mm -hmm. just one house by another. And part of the reason for that is that when each house does their own, even if they do it, they don't follow the same standards and then the house next to it isn't uh, tied in properly to the house that's done the work and so forth. So we're talking yeah. about how to accomplish that, uh, but it is going to mean a, a change in, in policy by the city, which is going to require a new ordinance. And, and so in some ways that's a little bit longer range thing for us to address, but we, it's uh, it very much aware of the need. Thank you, David. So, um, Colleen, this is Jim DeYoung, and I just wanted to add also, um, I think you're probably aware, but for other folks who may not be, uh, as we look at one of the city-owned sidewalks that they would be responsible for repairing, it also involves a couple of agencies when it involves something like vegetation, like a tree, uh, uprooting the sidewalk. And so you have a couple of departments there. And that goes back to your original point about how why it's so important to get all departments on the same page. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. Let's say, so that really is the end of sort of our formal presentation today. Uh, obviously, uh, any questions we'd be more than happy to answer. Yeah, you can either unmute yourself or type them into the chat. And with that, uh, really open it up for questions. I would just add about this survey, and I think Jim made it very clear, but the reason that we invited uh, many of you to this meeting is because we figure that you have communities that you communicate with, and we really hope that you'll turn around and and get this survey out to your constituents so that we're getting a broad general public. It's great that we've had about 30 people participating in this meeting, but we're hoping that we will hear from a lot, lot more people. And just to let everybody know on the survey, the survey is gonna re remain open for the next couple months. So um, obviously the sooner we can get results back, the sooner we can start incorporating it into this plan. But uh, at any time, if anybody would like to comment, we are uh, more than welcome and more than definitely looking for those comments. So yeah, if someone asks you next month, can I still fill out the survey? The answer is absolutely yes. Um, Travis, if I could just add again, this is Jim. If uh, also one of your organizations feels as though you need a presentation, to your specific organization, say at an annual meeting uh, that you may be having, uh, we'd be more than well, we'd be more than willing to participate in that if you would want us to. So again, contact us if you'd like uh, that participation. And thank you all for attending today. But again, take advantage of the survey, just like in November. Don't forget to vote. <laughs> thank you, <laughs> Jim, and thank you, everybody. I I share our appreciation with your. Uh, coming to the meeting. I hope you've learned something and I hope you know we're trying to make our democracy work. So thank you for giving it the try. Again, if anybody would like a copy of either the transcript or the video today, uh, if you email that ADA underscore STL email address, uh, we would be more than happy to get it over to you. Oh, we have a question coming in from the chat. Thanks, Travis. <clears throat> the question is, 
would there be a database like site for us to like pinpoint post comments work status post pictures of locations in need of attention Uh, not particularly associated with the ADA transition plan. We're currently not planning on that, but I do know that the city does offer a service in which people, residents can reach out. And uh, David, Eric, correct me if I get the name wrong, but that's the Citizen Services Bureau? Yeah, for certainly if it's an accessibility issue, it is appropriate to make a, uh, a complaint to the Citizen Service Bureau <clears throat> because that's a mechanism that requires city staff to respond to the issue and, and to make a record that they've responded. But in addition to that, uh, we welcome anything coming to our office too. So come at us both ways. Uh, and We try to make sure nothing gets missed. And uh, so feel free to be as pushy as you feel like. Uh, there was another question that I saw that, that that seemed to come up, and that was where did we get the the captioning for this? And the answer to that is that the reason this is in Google Meet is because Google Meet does automatic captioning, and the captions captioning, as I've seen it, is pretty good. They just spelled Google Meet M E A T instead of E G T, but it's still pretty good. Yeah, and any uh, comments that we receive back on the survey will be passed on to the Office on the Disabled as well. So there is a spot on the survey in, for, in which uh, you can comment on a particular challenges you might have around the city, and all that data at the end of this will go on. Will go to David's office. Um, my name is Naomi Sewell, and I'm president of Missouri Council of the Blind. And um, so I did have a question. Um, and I'm glad the idea about um, using beacons was brought up because I was thinking the same thing. But what I wanted to know, too, is people come in uh, for various reasons and information that they might need to fill out, might need assistance filling out, um, or various types of, of information is not necessarily, necessarily accessible. So just wanted to know if that was something that um, is being looked at. Well, let me say that that's a, a, a two-way street. We try to deal with the various offices to try to get their people who interact with the public to be, uh, you, you know, able to effectively communicate. And there are a lot of people who work for the city and some remember and some don't. And so... We also, as soon as we hear of a problem, we will intervene and we will work that problem out. Uh, and so we always would welcome somebody to contact our office, the Office on the Disabled, and whatever office they're attempting to communicate with, and, and we'll get that solved. Seeing no more questions, Again, we would like to very much thank you for joining us today. Uh, we know you guys, this time is incredibly valuable and uh, definitely thank you for taking a little bit of your afternoon to talk with us. Uh, we all think this is a very exciting project uh, to really start to uh, start that momentum moving forward to continue to make St. Louis the best and most accessible city it could possibly be. And as time goes on, if you think of a question two days from now, reach out to us and we'll definitely get back to you. And with that, everybody, uh, have a great day, and uh, we'll all race out to the survey. Thank you very much, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>